Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us and welcome to Asia Arts Archive. Um, my name is Özge Arsoy, I'm the Public Programs Lead at AAA. And we are very happy to have Köken Ergun with us today. Um, Köken is an artist and filmmaker based in Istanbul. Um, I just want to say a couple of words about his practice, but then we will switch the, the subject to after the archive. So Köken mostly works with um, cultural rituals and these range from state ceremonies to, to war reenactments and um, I'm thinking about the examples, um, language Olympics to, to weddings. Um, and what's compelling for us as the, the organization and as the, the pro public programs team is that um, he has a research driven practice to, to begin with and during this research he engages the, the subjects of these rituals as well as a range um, of social scientists in the process. This is for the research of the work, this is for the production of the work, this is also for the dissemination of the work. So he is also very much involved in the, the ways in which the, the work is talked about in different um, platforms. But today, um, Köken is going to, to speak about After the Archive, the, the artist-run initiative that he's been a part of since 2016. And uh, since then, After the Archive has been organizing talks and workshops with individuals and with the, the NGOs that, um, that build different types of independent archives. These, are, these could be LGBTI communities uh, about displaced people or disappeared people. So it's mostly lesser known histories, if I may call it so. Um, so when we think about your artistic practice, there's kind of a parallel in the, the way that you continue to engage people in the, the development of a conversation around the, the subject matter itself. I don't want to say so much, but maybe I'll just thank you, Kökan, for joining us, and I'll leave the stage to you. Thank you. Thank you. Is it okay like this or this? Or <coughs> Can you hear me like this? Okay. Um, yes, we start from Istanbul, and we're going to actually end in Istanbul. Uh, but uh, at the end of the talk, I might talk about similar similarities between Istanbul and Hong Kong, two cities which had major uprisings. And we've seen yesterday another demonstration, <coughs> the vigil. Uh, so the conversation is and uh, at the end is going to come there. But first, I want to talk about what I do as part of this uh, initiative called After the Archive, with a question mark, uh, because our aim is to ask a lot of questions and encourage the, the public in Istanbul, uh, greater public, uh, to uh, be involved in a constructive dialogue uh, and uh, share knowledge instead of producing knowledge instead of us producing knowledge, we invite other people to talk about topics which relate to archives, not necessarily directly uh, about archives, uh, but about uh, especially archiving social memory. So why did I start with uh, mentioning Istanbul and Hong Kong together? Uh, because these are two cities under pressure. Uh, the, the in Istanbul is under pressure by the Erdogan regime and Hong Kong is under pressure by mainland China. So at these times, uh, preserving social memory <coughs> becomes an issue. It becomes an issue because it's a problematic, it's not easy. And it's also a necessity to, at these times, to preserve our cultural memory and social memory and to talk about it. So. The driving force behind this is, as Özge said, uh, as my and my friends in the initiative, their personal works. We are a group of artists, writers and curators. Uh, but the, the main driving force is what we learned at Gezi in 2013. What we learned in Gezi uprising in 2013 was the spirit of solidarity, which some of us knew about, but we didn't practice it at least for myself, <coughs> I was living in Berlin and I decided to move back to Istanbul during the times of the demonstrations. I said, like, this is probably a better place to work from uh, because I learned a lot on the ground during Gezi. And uh, when <coughs> two years later, in 2015, another artist initiative in Istanbul uh, invited me as an artist to do something in their space. They gave me a carte blanche and uh, 
because I was inspired from the collective working together two years ago and because I've been part of a lot of different initiatives, a lot of solidarity groups, uh, to make an exhibition wasn't interesting for me as an artist. To curate an exhibition as a curator was also not interesting for me. I wanted something that could be uh, more uh, sharing knowledge, dialogues. And it was a small place in, in the old city. And we started, uh, oh yeah, I mean, I invited another uh, friend of mine, another artist, uh, because I didn't want to do it alone because uh, it, it shouldn't be something about me or anybody else. So it should be a collective. So we start two people in the beginning. And we start having this much audience. You know, It was 15 people, 10 people. It was in the middle of the winter. A lot of bombs were exploding in Istanbul. It was a very, very tough time. And uh, we, we had the idea like to bring people to the fireplace and to just screen films or talk about things and uh, we talked about in between two of us we talked about urgencies of the time what is urgent what is the most emergent situation now it wasn't producing aesthetic art it wasn't producing uh, even uh, long-term art projects but it was like momentary to discuss what is happening that month what was happening that month was, apart from uh, the regime's crackdown on dissidents, uh, academics, the fear mongering in the country, uh, archives were attacked, or archives could be attacked. So we, we had the example of one major newspaper, which is discontinued now, Radical, not because of political reasons, they said, but this has never been explained. First, the newspaper was closed, shut down. And suddenly, around that time, their database on the internet and the access to their website was deleted. So a newspaper was deleted. When a newspaper is deleted, this was the leading uh, newspaper, especially in cultural and arts and critical thinking. So we start asking both of us and we also asked other people like, what does it mean to delete an archive of like our memory? Because we wrote a lot of text for that, uh, some of our friends or we were uh, as artists, our shows were reviewed there and there were a lot of discussions in this newspaper. And it discontinued, and their memory was also discontinued. But then, later, it was brought back, somehow. But I think not completely uh, all the materials that they had in the past. So this brought us the question mark, the question mark that you see in this, uh, in this, the title. So we found the title after the archive, because I said, we, we said, like, what is urgent at this moment in, in Turkey, in Istanbul? Archives. And the question mark after the archive. Okay, we collect, they collect archives, not we. They collect archives. What do they do with this archive? Okay, it's developed. But then what happens to the archive when the regime is closing down on you? And at that time, another major newspaper, Cumhuriyet, which was one of the oldest newspaper uh, coming from the late Ottoman period, uh, early Republican era, was under threat of the regime. Uh, a lot of their journalists were taken to court and uh, people were protecting the, 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 uh, the newspaper by going there. Uh, I must open a parenthesis after 2013. Uh, Turkey has never been a apolitical geography. It's always been very political, but unusual circles of society became politicized. So artists couldn't produce because they had to attend a lot of demonstrations, they had to go to this, they had to support their friends taken, being taken to court. And then uh, daily base, we would go in front of Cumhuriyet newspaper and try to support them by being there physically, just like how uh, last night thousands and thousands of people just went there just to be 
physically, of course, there's other layers to that, but uh, people who were completely apolitical before, the newspaper they were reading for many, many years, they brought up with this newspaper, was in the had the danger of being closed down. So they were going there. So we were familiar with this issue. So we said, let's make a talk about disappearing archives. So who do we invite? So we invited the archivist of that newspaper called Jumhuriyet. And the archivist preferred not to come to our place, the place that was given us by the other initiative. So we went there, we went to the newspaper. We invited our audience, there were maybe 10 people to follow us. We met, and we went to the Jumhuriyet newspaper and uh, we went downstairs in their depot and we met the, the archivist and uh, we asked them, what will happen if, to, what will happen to your archive if one day the government, the state, closes you, shuts you down. And so we basically went them, went to them with questions. So that's the question mark in the, after the archive. What happens to your archive? Um, I'll skip this. So this is the lady who is running the archive uh, since I think 30 years or 40 years. And here it's a very comfortable, <laughs> like relaxed environment that we are in her office. And uh, she's telling us uh, how she's sorting out the newspapers and we found out that it's a very old-fashioned way of archiving uh, and it doesn't have a B plan. So this biggest newspaper in Turkey didn't have a B plan if something happens to their newspaper, if to their company. Uh, so that was quite painful for the people also there uh, who were discussing with the archivist because it would affect all of us if this newspaper's archive is deleted one day. Uh, in, in fact, like most of it is not digitized. So we found out a lot of uh, shortcomings about archives of these kind of newspapers. And, and uh, as you see here, like it's not a, like a lecture that she's giving. It's more like, a, like people talking. So here you will see the younger archivists who are talking about their experiences, about uh, completely another topic about the corporate archive, how <coughs> a corporate who's doing a lot of real estate is kind of hiding some of their archives from even the <laughs> judiciary. So it was really, really very internal. But now you can see all of these on YouTube uh, and uh, it's open to public. So going back to the space that was given to us for the duration of, I think, one month or no, two months. Um, we then thought about forced disappearances. That's another issue in Turkey. Especially after the military coup in 1980, the state and the army has been <coughs> uh, held responsible uh, for the forced disappearance of uh, several people in the country's south east, which is predominantly a Kurdish area. There's a fantastic organization in uh, Istanbul called the Memory Center. And these two girls are from, from that. So we invited them to give us a talk about how they work and how they keep a database of forced disappearances since 1980 until present time. And uh, you see where I think Özge is one of I think you were at this talk as well. Um, so here in this talk, uh, they're talking about how they're preserving the memory of the people who were disappeared forcibly uh, between 1980s and late 1990s. And they presented us the methodology, how they work and uh, And they showed us 
how they analyze the data and how they share it. As you see here, the map on the right is the cases of forced disappearances. So as you see, they're predominantly in the west, uh, southwest. Uh, and they told us that even it's happening in the west of Turkey, which is more Turkish dominated, the people who are forcibly disappeared are always Kurdish people. Um, and then they are compiling data from other people, interviewing people. They have a lot of oral history uh, sessions uh, with people in the southeast, and they go. And Istanbul is on the map because Istanbul is the biggest population of Kurdish people in Turkey, not only the south, uh, I mean, as, 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 a, as a city. Um, and then they report these cases to the judiciary if something happens. In most cases, the, reason, the, the, the people who were responsible for these dis forced disappearances have not been found. Um, they help the cases to go to the European Court of Human Rights with very few results. And they also have interviews with people and this one is in turkish we couldn't translate it yet but in the future we will translate actually sorry not in turkish it's kurdish so he's uh, he has a relative who was who and he's talking about this so this memory center has made uh, exhibitions on this issue uh, at another art space in Turkey, even uh, at this time, these are possible. These are done because the, uh, the 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 state is not targeting small spaces, uh, whereas it's targeting academics and scholars. But still, there is room for these kind of events and exhibitions to happen. Uh, we did a lot of other talks, but I'm going to focus on uh, some of them uh, and uh, because we don't have so much time. But then I'll show you the change uh, in our audience numbers. One year later, we became like this. This is a famous philosopher in Turkey. Uh, she prefers to call her... Like, she's not a philosopher, she's like an um, image... Uh, in German, I know, but in English... Uh, he's, she's an art critic, she's a social critic as well. She's a popular writer also, like, I mean, she's uh, non-fiction, of course. Um, so, uh, what happened in this uh, first season when we did it, a lot of people started talking about after the archive. They heard about this, they said, like, uh, these guys are doing something. And then more and more people started coming. And then institution in Istanbul started coming to us and they said, we like what you do. And then, then we said, okay, let's collaborate. So big institutions like SALT, Studio X, Depo, who have their own funding, because we have no funding and we do not apply for funding. That's our policy. We only apply for funding to, uh, and we only got one funding from the European uh, Union uh, related uh, NGO in Turkey, and it was only enough to uh, publish a little booklet and to open a website. So we are uh, principally against getting funding and we're principally against getting bigger. Uh, not in audience numbers, obviously, we've got much bigger in audience numbers. Uh, we also needed uh, more people in the group, so we're now four, uh, five people. Uh, four of them are Turkish. Uh, one of them is a Dutch uh, curator who lives in uh, Istanbul. Uh, so unfortunately, four male, one female, but uh, we're trying to make it more gender equal, equal uh, in the future. Uh, and we get help from a lot of other friends. So uh, on a voluntary basis, people come help us to videotape, to control the, um, the crowd, to put chairs. Uh, so it's a very communal effort, uh, what we're doing. So here you see uh, a talk at Studio X, uh, which is uh, partnering with the Columbia, Uni uh, is it Columbia University? Columbia University. And, uh, and uh, in another occasion, we partnered with SALT. Some of you might know SALT. It's a very uh, strong uh, project, uh, research-based, uh, uh, and with a big library. It's a big art institution, which is not only interested in exhibitions, uh, but also uh, very rich public programming. So at that time, uh, another urgency was ecology. 
uh, for us. So we started uh, to talk with SALT and that also fit their program. And we proposed to have a speaker from Russia, from St. Petersburg, uh, which is the biggest uh, seed archive, one of the biggest seed archives in the world. This is Professor uh, Igor Loskutov. And SALT kindly helped us to fly this professor and to pay for the hotel and everything. So like they are uh, helping us to do that and we bring the speaker. And he gave a, um, a very scientific talk uh, about how, uh, what they do. Uh, and this was very interesting. It was our uh, biggest audience so far. Uh, people came from Diyarbakir, from Ankara to this talk because uh, one of the things that we do, we are very strong on social media and we work very hard because we're not an institution. We're doing this voluntarily. We're not tired of inviting people. So we really like, uh, we don't only put uh, things on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Uh, for each talk, we have a, uh, an Excel sheet that we share on Google Drive. We're five people and everybody has to bring minimum 20 people or 10 if it's really very difficult. And we uh, not only email people, but we also call people. We call people and say, please come to our talk because this is, we think this is important, not only to make them come to the talk to have a big audience, but to have a discussion. So we are, we're targeting, for example, if this is an ecology, about ecology, we called all the um, uh, permaculture organizations, professors, uh, seed uh, activists, and uh, they were involved in a discussion with the speaker later. So we don't want this to be just a lecture uh, by someone who comes and goes into the city. Uh, and discussions also takes place because the, the discussion of collecting seeds, uh, which is another, another memory, if you say, if you, if you may, if I may say, uh, because uh, like as the professor told us, in the time of uh, terrible destruction and chaos in the world, when planting is no longer possible after a war, for example, uh, as a little country, let's say, what do you do? You have to find seeds to start your farming again. And where do you go? You have to go to four or five seed centers in the world, which are actually holding the world's seeds. So this was a problematic, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, uh, it started in the Soviet Union. It's a legendary institution and, uh, and uh, they uh, go, this is a uh, tour they did. I think in 1985. So they came to Turkey and to these locations to collect seeds, samples, brought it back to St. Petersburg, store them. So ecological memory of Turkey is stored in this uh, vault. Uh, of course, it's protecting. Uh, something for humanity, but it's also uh, it's also has the like it has the access to it. So there were a lot of discussions. Oh, this is a good map. Uh, there were a lot of discussions in the audience. Who has the right to uh, protect? This is the the map of uh, gene banks in the world. This is the Chinese collection. The third. This is the Indian collection, and we have the fourth fourth collection. the fourth biggest one. China has one in Beijing. Like a country like Indonesia does not have a seed bank. You can watch all these on our website uh, and YouTube channel. And Okay, so this was our most scientific talk, but it was also uh, discussed a lot afterwards. People start writing about it because they thought this was very useful. So then we started introducing the word useful to our initiatives. Like we have to do something useful, not like uh, inviting uh, or picking up a subject which is already known or it's not going to create a dialogue. So uh, we reached out to the LGBT community in Istanbul. So we found an archive which was never revealed to public about transsexual stage performers in the 80s and early 90s in Turkey. So this was a young man called Serdar Soydan and uh, he has collected um, 
a massive archive from newspaper clippings to oral history recordings to books and he's a literary scholar uh, himself and um, I think his thesis at the time he was working on Turkish uh, early Turkish fiction uh, and each fiction he was uh, l looking in each uh, fiction work looking at uh, the uh, any words about homosexuality and the slang uh, homosexual slang how it's uh, developing in time and how it is hidden in the book and he knows like most of those authors were actually uh, closeted uh, gay uh, individuals but they couldn't open up but they were giving this with little hints in their in their work so he was collecting these words so he's an expert of this kind of scholar, uh, scholarship uh, literally scholarship but we were interested and again i'm going to go back to gezi because after gezi in 2013 the lgbt co community in istanbul got very politicized and uh, we're very proud of what they're doing it's uh, i'm just comparing it with europe where um, uh, the LGBT, uh, for example, if you give the example of a gay parade in Istanbul, it's a very political gay parade. But if you give the ex example of a Berlin gay parade, it's very commercial and very sexual oriented. Whereas in Istanbul, it has been very different. But of course, Erdogan stopped it. He doesn't want to allow any kind of demonstrations in Turkey, so he's afraid of the LGBT gay parade as well. Um, so we thought that the LGBT community uh, would be interested in this kind of archive and we wanted to be useful so we chose uh, this archive which has never been revealed before. Um, So at one point he's talking about uh, the um, the midnight raids to nightclubs where the trans individuals were performing and their exile to Ankara, which sounds like a concentration camp story because they're put on a on a train carriage and some of them jump from the carriage. Uh, their future was never known. Some of them came back. And it started with these stories and then also then uh, because he has created a lot of a big archive from newspaper clippings. Uh, in this archive you see how uh, homosexuality was treated by the mass media in the, uh, in the 80s. So uh, it's very difficult for me to translate these but they're uh, tre treated like criminals. Uh, space oddities and uh, every kind of like curse uh, about them and um, this is one of the surviving transsexual uh, performers at the time she's giving an interview to him it's also talking about how uh, sex change operations were portrayed by the media and on one hand and on the other hand uh, the difficulties of the people who change sex uh, at the time and of course giving examples also of our present it's still of course not an easy thing to change your sex uh, in, in, a, in, in Turkey so but uh, he was uh, grounding this in the history uh, of the 70s and 80s and uh, the audience uh, was asking a lot of questions uh, in this talk as well. In fact, this was our biggest audience. We had to open another room at SALT and gave a live feed to that room. And from this po point on, we uh, started uh, doing Facebook Live uh, record uh, coverage of our uh, talks. So we have also an audience on social media uh, who are able to ask questions uh, online. And uh, some of these questions can be very constructive. Um, so, as I said, we grew in our audiences, and uh, this is the, the lady who was giving the talk about an archive. I will come back to that. Uh, this is the previous uh, talk that you have seen, and also we are very careful about our video 
video video uh, recordings we always use two cameras one camera is usually pointing at the speaker the other is usually pointing at the the audience and when the audience ask the questions midway we immediately catch them and then we try to edit this and we edit it uh, almost collectively like one of us is in charge of editing and then we keep notes and we say like this wasn't good let's change this and then we put the um, the full image on the uh, recording so we have a like a pleasurable and informative uh, recording at the end um, so and also we have uh, our favorite carpet on the floor which we always bring because we think like this kind of setup i'm not criticizing aa but like we we think like <laughs> we, it's many institutions do this uh, uh the distance between the speaker and the audience we want to we want to minimize it so what we do is that we we obtain the carpet from a friend of us and then we travel with this carpet to all the institutions who are holding uh hosting us and we put a lot of cushions on it so we want people to relax and again as i said this is part of our uh, experiences in Gezi, it's this kind of feng shui that we learned in, in, in the park. So, and it's been proving very, very successful. Everybody's talking about uh, the comfortable uh, situation of the after the archive talks. Uh, this is an example from our uh, one of the recent uh, talks, and uh, she is a historian and a let's say amateur uh, archivist and she's a social media figure uh she whatever she shares on social media is uh shared by many other people uh, she doesn't work for any corporate uh, like uh, institution or university but she's um let's say a freelance archivist and we wanted to tackle the question of uh we want to tackle the question why is she so popular why do people follow her account, uh, Twitter account, so fanatically? And what does it mean, archive being a popular uh, medium? So she has uh, famously shared a very old recording of uh, a Turkish, actually late Ottoman female author, Halide Edip Adıvar, on a boat in a silent movie she found, I think, in New Zealand archives. Uh, don't ask me how she got it uh, and I think she didn't talk about it I think and uh, the minute that she shared this uh, it was a big hit uh, and this is the video as you see in the background so this uh, institution is a primarily literary institution called the upper Kredi cultural center which also has hosted the previous uh, design biennial in Istanbul and they have this really nice uh, room and uh, we collaborated with them for this talk because we were expecting a big audience and then in this uh, talk we were curious why her material is so popular and what it means for the uh, for uh, archival materials to be uh, distributed on social media and uh, why are people uh, so fascinated about these materials and one of the answers we found was because it was dealing with a glorious past of uh, Turkish Republic, the beginnings of early Turkish Republic, the modernist change, and of course uh, Atatürk, the leader of Turkey, and uh, in a time when we have a supposedly Islamic government uh, for the last 17 years, and because of the polarization in the country, uh, the nostalgia for the secular so-called so secular period and the early Republican period has risen to a fanatic level. So if somebody saw, we found out an, an image or a video, just like this video, she is one of the leaders of the uh, independence war. Uh, and uh, this was the this was the the nerve uh, that she was touching in the public was the nerve of the anti Erdogan anti Islamic uh, past. So uh, nostalgia of that period uh, was uh, more popular uh, than any other archival material. So uh, as I gave the example of the newspaper, we were of course in the beginning, but we ha only had 10 people for an extremely urgent case uh, because our history could have been deleted. But in this case, it's a more like um, 
it's another polarized situation we found out. But it was very interesting even uh, for that. Uh, another very popular talk was, this is Depo, another very important institution in Istanbul, which has been uh, targeted by the government massively, but they're still standing. Uh, this was a very special case. Uh, our guest was from Athens, uh, and he as actually was born in Turkey, so he is the Greek Istanbul uh, citizen. Uh, Istanbul's population uh, in 19 uh, early Republican period was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, half and half, half Muslim, half non-Muslim, and this was primarily the Greek population. Uh, but uh, they have been. Uh, Somehow, some of them have been forcibly removed in 1923 because of an arrangement between Greece and Turkey. And, uh, but the majority have left afterwards, uh, after the anti-Greek sentiment has risen and Turkish nationalism have uh, risen. So this is another nerve in the society. The good old times when the Greeks were here. The good old times when Istanbul was a multicultural uh, city. So um, uh, we went to Athens uh, because we happened to be there during Documenta. So we uh, visited the archives uh, of uh, Asia Minor Studies, uh, Asia Minor Center for Asia Minor Studies, and uh, it has the biggest archive of the 1923 population exchange between the newly founded Turkish Republic and the newly founded Greek uh, state. So what happened in 1923, after uh, the Ottoman Empire ended and the Turkish Republic uh, was uh, established, and uh, the two countries have uh, signed an agreement that they would forcibly remove uh, or uh, push, uh, the Greek uh, state would push their Muslim uh, citizens to the newly founded Turkey. And I'm a product of that myself, because my grand-grandmother was living in what is now called Greece. It's uh, near Thessaloniki. Uh, it was part of the Ottoman Empire. We were a Muslim community. And then she had been pushed, so that's why I ended up being born in Istanbul. Uh, and uh, likewise, uh, if you mirror it, on the other side of the spectrum, uh, the Greek Orthodox uh, people, uh, citizens of the ex-Ottoman Empire and the new Turkish Republic have been told to go, have been told to leave in a very quick amount of time. So this is one of the ships that were taking them from, if I'm not mistaken, from the south of Turkey. Those of you might have known Cappadocia, the famous place where you have these... Pier Pasolini shot the film Medea there, uh, the famous geographical uh, formations. Uh, and uh, they've been put on ships and sent to uh, an island in the Aegean. Why did we choose this topic? Because not only because it was an ongoing issue for the Turkish uh, community who had uh, ancestors coming from there, who were subject to the population exchange, but of course because of the Syrian refugees in Turkey. Uh, the biggest amount of numbers of Syrian refugees in the world are in, Istan in, in Lebanon and in Turkey, and this is a huge uh, social um, issue in, uh, in, in Turkey. Uh, it's uh, discussed a lot for various reasons, uh, part of racism against Arab communities and to employment issues and those who support the right of Syrian refugees living in Turkey, those who oppose to that. So this is an ongoing conversation. So we want to uh, introduce a historical example of people who have actually pushed from Turkey to Greece and how their memory has been kept. And it was a very interesting archive because it was a very important oral history archive. And uh, these are some of the relatives, uh, grandsons of the people who were forcibly uh, removed because of this exchange. And uh, we had a very older, elder uh, crowd at this uh, to talk and it was very emotional and I'm not getting emotional, I'm just thirsty. <laughs> Yeah, it was very emotional and it was, I think, our longest Q&A session. Only the Q&A was like one hour and a half because people wanted to, like, the, even people came and said, like, my grandmother is from this town uh, in present Greece. They were asking uh, this gentleman, Stavros Anastidis, uh, do you have an archive on that? But he was saying, no, I keep the archive of people move, who were moved from Greece to Turkey. 
And I've been to that archive. It's it's a fantastic archive in very hard, uh, hard um, going through a hard time because it's obviously Greece uh, financially. Um, in this archive, there are handwritten maps from memory. So the people who have been removed from their lands in the West Anatolia uh, go there. And these people have only met them 20, 30 years later. So they're already, already old. And uh, at that time, there's only a recording, like big recording machines like that. And uh, usually, uh, I don't have the image here, but he, she, he showed it. Uh, usually there is, oh, I didn't do anything this point off. Uh, usually there is uh, another person like writing uh, what they say and uh, then they ask them uh, how do you remember your village in Turkey, old Turkey? And they're, uh, they're asked to make a map and there is this collection of beautiful maps, handwritten maps by the grandfathers who are no longer alive and uh, they also ask them to sing songs that they remember before they die so they can preserve uh, the, the songs and the oral uh, tradition. So uh, yeah, this was an extremely emotional talk and um, yeah, another person asking a question. Um, our next guest will be, some of you might know, is Bonaventure Nedikung, and he is also working on archives and in Savi Contemporary in Berlin. He has this fantastic project, I mean, with his uh, team, of course, uh, of colonial archives. And colonial archive project is very interesting for us because we visited in Berlin many years ago, and it started like this, I'll say very briefly, when Bonaventure was at an event. Uh, somebody came up to him and uh, he he was asked, like, where are you from? He said, I'm from Cameroon. And he said, oh, that's a French colony. And Bonaventure said, no, that's a German colony. How come you don't know? And then he had this light bulb and uh, he said, like, we must work on this. Like, because in Germany, a lot of people in the public don't know that they uh, had uh, German West Africa, German East Africa. So the Germans didn't know about their colonial history. So Savi started asking the people, their friends, first of all, to uh, gather material. Uh, maybe I can see. Um, to bring objects related to that colonial past. And it could be a chocolate box with Negroes on it, which is very common in Europe. Uh, or these kind of books or solidarity with the public of Namibia, it says here. It's from 19, I can't read it, but it's DDR, so it's an old one. So they, they display these, they ask people to bring uh, objects and they display this on a corridor in Savi. So this, is, this was our interest. We wanted to invite Bonaventure to talk about this. He will start to talk about that, but he will also talk about being a biologist himself. This is his primary, like, let's say, occupation before being a curator. Uh, by the way, he was co-curating the last documenta and he's curating uh, now the Finnish pavilion in, Ista uh, in Venice, Biennial, sorry. Uh, and uh, he's going to introduce uh, his concept of apop apoptotic archive, uh, which in biology is the uh, when the body kills the ill cells, the diseased cells, and they eat those cells to get uh, to make way for the other cells to to live in the in the body. So he was asking when we met. He was asking the question. So uh, we say archive, 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 but. <clears throat> what happens to these materials and how much is it kept and uh, and also of course he was meaning about the colonial archives like the colonial museums in Europe and which displays our materials are shown and uh, he was asking the question uh, what happens if the archive some of the things disappear what does it mean for us uh, and is this uh, something I think that he will trigger in his talk so, um, coming back to this talk, which was one of our favorites, then I'll kind of jump to another topic. 
Uh, this is Professor Zeynep Sayın. She's talking about unarchive, unarchive. It's coming from the Greek, not UN, but UN. It's coming from Greece, uh, Greek, ancient Greek. And it's, she was talking about the impossibility of creating an archive and the involuntary, uh, like people not wanting to be archive. So the impossibility of creating an archive for her was Auschwitz. So she's an Agamben expert and she usually uh, works on this topic. So uh, she talked about the, the famous figure Musulman in, in Auschwitz uh, and, then, and then argued that in times of genocide, uh, it's a time when archiving is impossible because it happens very quickly and uh, we don't have uh, that memory now. But then he, she uh, brought the subject to Gezi. She was there as well. And she talked about the Kalenderi uh, dervish, der, dervishes, uh, dervishes, you know the word dervishes, the ones who spread the religion and walking around, and uh, walking around the world. Uh, so, so there's the Sufi dervishes, for example. So uh, she gave the example of the Kalenderi dervishes uh, in history, uh, which treated uh, material possession as, uh, mind my saying, literally as shit. So money as shit or possession as shit. And then she linked this to Gezi. She, uh, she said in Gezi, uh, I saw people who were uh, the other of the other of the other, which we've never seen in our public sphere. And then they came to Gezi park and then they were very active in <coughs> making things and and then they disappeared and then she said they wanted to be unarchived they didn't want to be on record they wanted to disappear and she supported this and this is a discussion that we do in Istanbul since 2013 whether to archive such a big demonstration or not, whether to represent this kind of energy or not. Um, <clears throat> I remember myself when I was in the park. We were many artists together and without anyone asking us, we said we should not make any artwork about what, what is happening right now. We should tell each other we should not do this. We should not turn this into a representational uh, gimmick where we start taking pictures and then exhibit this and everyone was nodding. And this was just when we were working in the park. I was uh, working as a nurse, basically. I was like distributing even ped uh, nedir um, <laughs> to ladies who were in their period sanitary pads and this was my job like I was just doing this all day like or Panadol like wh whoever had a headache we were helping so we, we all had uh, like something to do uh, at Gezi and uh, when we were very busy with these things we kind of felt uh, the danger of this kind of thing especially happening in, in a, such an exotic place for Europe Istanbul the, uh, the city between two continents. <coughs> we thought that the media from Europe will start coming to us and will start interviewing us, asking us questions. And uh, this was a very linear movement. There were no leaders, there were no personalities, and we resisted this, all of us. Uh, and at, uh, one year later, we found out that even people we didn't meet, they were talking about the same thing. So there was this very interesting collaboration of ideas of uh, not fetishizing this demonstration called Gezi. Uh, and this goes back to Professor Zeynep Sain's talk, uh, the people who want to be undocumented or who disappear. And uh, uh, when the media came, I remember myself, I think a couple of newspapers from Germany came, they wanted to talk with us, but we were pointing them at people who are not artists, not doctors, nothing, just, but people who were there in the park. We said, why don't you talk to them? Because we know that they will put our image on the, on the newspaper and we will be talking about something. And this could be, uh, we thought this would be wrong. We don't want to represent anything. This is a linear movement. 
Um, and years later, we still have very, very, very few examples of artworks from Turkey-based artists who made something with Gezi. And as far as you research, they've never been shown in Turkey, right? Okay. Um, I'll just show you one example uh, of an artist who was very active in Gezi as anybody. She was working on the desk, information desks. Like her job was to sit all day for like, I don't know how many days we were there at the park, 10 days, 11 days, uh, just sitting there. And because people needed to get information, there were old people coming, it's like, what is this? What is happening? Or there were people like, what can I be good for? Like, can I do something? And so she was trying to help. And she's an artist herself as well. So uh, I like this example because she, she actually made something related to Gezi, but she did not use a single image. And this is also the reason why I'm not showing any image from Gezi 2013 in this talk. Hi, my name is Zeyno. I'm here because I was part of the Gezi uprising in June 2013 in Istanbul. First four days there were protests to protect Gezi Park from demolition and to stop the construction of a shopping mall followed by two days of uprising and 15 days of occupation. I'm here because I was part of the uprising, but I'm not here only because I was part of the uprising. Millions of people were part of the uprising and my story is not more special or more extra extraordinary than any other. I'm here because after the uprising, I have discussed it a lot, politically and academically. I was invited to many places to talk about it. I have talked about it politically and academically in Mexico, in Belgium, in Greece, in Brazil. In Mexico, in Belgium, in Greece, in Brazil, and in many meetings in Turkey, I have discussed the uprising methodically. I made categories. I talk about the why, the how, the who. I have talked about the social groups who have participated. I categorized and I classified. I have tried to predict the future. I have commented on the residue of the resistance. I have shown many pictures and videos. I have talked a lot and answered many questions. The discussions were great and useful, academically and politically. Then I have realized something. After every talk or panel or symposium, when the formal part was over and when we went out for a bite or for a drink, the questions were suddenly changing. How was the daily life? Where did you take shower? Did you really sleep there every night? Weren't you afraid? Not even when people started to die? Did people really open their houses for strangers? And I realized I was able to answer those questions with the same excitement and engagement. And even after gigabytes of images, texts, videos, discussions, blogs, I realized there was something lacking. I felt the lack as well the human experience. I realized we needed to talk about the human experience, the emotions, the affects, the epic side of the truth, as Benjamin calls it. So I decided to tell the story. This so she story tells the story of her days in Gezi without using a single image, just divides the conversation into uh, titles. Uh, the titles are <coughs> written at the back. She is older than I am, and she actually witnessed the coup d'etat. This is somebody she who came to her information desk. She said, even in the coup d'etat period, I remember having hope for better days. Now, I just feel suicidal. I opened my mouth to comfort her, and I paused. I opened my mouth to comfort her, but I couldn't find anything to say. There was barely any hope in my heart. It was just one week before the uprising and we were feeling miserable. Yeah, this is before Gezi started. So she started chronologically before and then she uh, goes to, the misery is about that. Uh, and I think the fear is when the police start uh, to uh, attack. Even if I didn't know them personally, I knew which organizations or parties or unions they belonged to. 
I knew how they would react in a situation. I knew if something bad happens, they knew what to do, who to call. But at that moment of uprising, I didn't know anything. I didn't know if the 16-year-old woman next to me knew the number of the Bar Association or the activist lawyers. I didn't know if she knew she shouldn't hold a hot canister with naked hands. I didn't know if the crowd would know what to do when someone gets arrested. It was a different fear, a fear that I never felt before. Fear of feeling responsible and fear of not being able to control what you are responsible for. as if they were seeing it for the first time. The joy of victory last, lasted like half an hour. And then we asked, now what? How are we going to keep the park? How are we going to keep the crowd together in order to keep the park? The most common feeling was sacrifice. Yet it does not explain the state of mind of the people around me during the park occupation. It was more like a dissolving feeling, a feeling that I disappears, your ego disappears, bodily needs disappear, and you just dissolve in the body and the soul of the resistance. You don't care what your body needs, you don't feel hungry, you don't feel sleepy. A feeling in your stomach that keeps you going without eating and sleeping. A feeling that I disappears, your ego disappears, bodily needs disappear and you just dissolve in the body and the soul of the resistance. To start, to start with, we thought we needed a poem just to find each other. We found a table and wrote the name of our group on it. As soon as there was a table came people with their needs and questions. We knew we should build a life a life of park's own, in order to keep the occupation alive. Logistics, finding and distributing, tents and blankets, food and drinks, organizing the information flow. There were millions of works to do. Um, so this, in my opinion, uh, is a different way of archiving. After archiving emotions, experiences, the effect. Uh, like that professor was saying, like it is problematic to archive a social uprising like that <coughs> and prob uh, problematic even to represent it, especially outside of that country. Not in that country, but outside of that country. Uh, especially at that time in Europe, which did not have any uh, recent history of these kind of demonstrations and experiences, because Tahrir happened. Uh, yes, Occupy happened, but it was very small compared to Gezi. And then Umbrella Movement happened, but like uh, people coming to the park were from uh, Canada, from Norway, and uh, they were exoticizing a lot of things, and they wanted to make exhibitions about Gezi. We refused. <coughs> we refused, and uh, they didn't understand first, and then... Uh, Thanks God, umbrella, hap umbrella happened <laughs> years after, so it wasn't the only the case. Uh, I'm pretty sure that you ha here discussed this in Hong Kong uh, among yourself. But I just wanted to give an example uh, when I'm finishing my talk about uh, the majority, uh, the dominant approach uh, in a city like Istanbul uh, against representation of uh, a very collective uh, event that has been participated by people who were impossible to see or invisible before. And that's why the professor was saying the unarchive, the ar unarchivable, or the people who don't want to be in the archive. So that's another question mark for our initiative. Uh, thank you. Maybe to warm up the room, I can ask the first question, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, I would love to hear more about how you've <coughs> been communicating with different types of um, arts communities, not only in Turkey, but outside of Turkey. For instance, I remember having a conversation with artist friends from Egypt and mm. um, about representing what happened at Tahrir, right? And one of them, Hassan Han, um, he was saying that you cannot necessarily commemorate something that has not 
come to an end. And then that's also one of the reasons why he said that he would refuse to, to do any type of works around the, the Tahrir Square, around the revolution in Egypt. And I'm curious if the conversations you're talking about, whether they only happened within the, the arts community in Istanbul, or whether you reached out to the different types of communities outside of the, the country and had shared similar frustrations, limitations, concerns, it would be great if you can uh, talk we about did that. Reach to, I mean, be, being an artist, I did reach to uh, artist friends in Egypt uh, in the first days when we didn't know what to do with the gas. We said like, guys, how did you cope with this gas? So we were like, first the practical questions. And then we asked friends in Athens, like, uh, how did you get together? Or what did you do uh, in getting together? Like, uh, like this artist Zeno also was probably in touch with a lot of uh, solidarity groups. But uh, you see, in those 14 days, we were t way too busy with ourselves. So those kind of conversations have been much, much later. <coughs> so of course, I mean, uh, we, I personally, I can only speak about myself, I never went to a solidarity group in another country to just to open this subject. But a lot of people came to Istanbul and um, of course, they knew about our decision. We talked about this all the time. As the artist says here, like the most important things come at the drinks part, right? We we talked about this, and uh, as far I, I completely agree with Hassan Khan. Like, how can you represent something that is still ongoing? O ongoing because we don't know how uh, long it will go on. I I personally believe that Gezi's spirit is still going on, and uh, this is exactly why we founded this initiative, this is uh, affecting our uh, art as well. Uh, but I do know that there are groups in Turkey who have been very, very closely uh, communicating with other uh, anarchist groups, other activist groups, other ecological groups. And uh, there have been a lot of discussions, endless discussions, of course, uh, to a point that we, we, we stopped. Uh, they they also stopped discussing and getting together in this. To be honest, I have to say that you're sometimes very tired to uh, represent, even represent, even to tell your experience to another friend in abroad, even though that friend is the person who would best understand you best. But you have a difficulty and you feel tired of telling him or her the experience that you had in Gezi or after Gezi. Uh, the reason I moved from Berlin to Istanbul after this was I didn't want to be in a position to be asked many questions about how did you do this Gezi, how did you do this in Gezi. I just wanted to be with people who have experienced it in the first hand. So me personally, I stepped back from these discussions. Uh, but of course, when it comes out, we of course talk about, I tell people that our decision was uh, like this. And it was a beautiful decision because we didn't really have a meeting for this. But after, after Gezi, there were uh, very different groups. I can name the, uh, the, the Orange Tent group, uh, the Artist Solidarity group, that we, we uh, discussed uh, how to preserve this energy, not with art, uh, projects or works, but like with other projects to reach out, uh, to write about it or to do something and to go to the forums, which when the, the park was dispersed by the community, uh, by the police, there each park in Istanbul, we don't have so many, <laughs> like small parts in each neighborhood was having nightly and evening forums. So we were mobilizing people to go to the forums. So we, we really worked hard. We just worked. We just worked. I mean, I personally, with my friends, we were getting news like saying, Saying that in the other side of town there is a solidarity group who wants to make uh, a, an evening chat about uh, what to do next. So they said, do you have a video camera? So I went. Or do you have a megaphone? So I went. So primarily my job was for two years just to work. I didn't want to produce ideas about what was happening. I just wanted to react and immediately just like to be there as, um, as a little soldier working. Then 
somebody is saying something, you know. And I'm now only talking about it after many years, just because it's in the context of an archive. I will never even talk about uh, Gezi as an event. I will refuse to do that. I'll just mention it. Uh, and uh, it's like, you know, when you love someone, you it's very difficult to tell this love to the third person, the moment. It's, it's really impossible to talk about this. So, uh, these kind of energies is like that, like what I felt in the vigil, even though I'm not from Hong Kong yesterday, I started crying when I see the people entering Victoria Park, uh, the energy, and I just cannot explain that. So, there is something between experiencing it in the first hand and talking about it. So. I personally felt tired, and I know that my other friends were feeling tired when another group from another country was coming and they were saying, like, can you please go? I don't want to go. I love them, but I don't want, because uh, it's very, very tiring to talk about these experiences. And this artist, Zeno, is one of the people who are very patient, and she keeps talking and talking to people. I couldn't do it. I'm more like uh, introvert in that sense. I hope that helped your <laughs> answer your question. Uh, thank you so much for presenting so many interesting archives that we probably wasn't aware about. And also tell us about the Gacy. I really enjoyed that part. And I just want to ask something that, uh, so personally, I agree very much that during the movement in the uprisings, uh, it's very important to be one of the cohesive mass to contribute as one of the uprising people. And but um, and also in in turn, as you said, because it's very emotional, very tiring. So and like very often, it's very hard to archive, to document things personally, or unable to archive, difficult to archive, refuse to archive. And in this situation, when media or social media became a very important source of material, and also sometimes they are can be very partial, taking different stances, and. Or, uh, or s social media can be very instant and simple. And these things became important sources for research for later on historians. And what do you think about it? Or how should we cope with it? Or should we even cope with it? Hmm. Uh, personally, I just thought when you were asking the question, did I ever look back to what I posted all those uh, months? Probably I didn't. And <clears throat> I do keep some of the videos that I shot. <clears throat> but at one point, I kind of stopped shooting. And I'm a video artist. I work with images. And I think it was after Gezi, when I developed my practice more and more, uh, that I dropped down the camera mostly. And I'm just watching people and like memorizing the experience rather than uh, spending time to record the experience, uh, which is primarily for another audience, right? So uh, you're right. I mean, the social media aspect is very important because we mobilized people with social media. So we were posting every 10 minutes, probably, uh, for two years after, because there were so many other things happening. And if somebody looks back to that, they can reach that. And they can, of course, find a lot of sources. And they can archive that in their own way. Um, it's up to them, but I think if we hear something like that in Istanbul, if somebody is making a project like that, I, I would uh, outrightly refuse or go after that person and say, don't do this. You were not there. Or yeah, I think nobody like uh, from our groups, let's say, has done anything. Uh, another art project was uh, done in a Turkish initiative uh, apartment project, and I think they first showed it in, 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 in Berlin, in their space in Berlin. They invited people from the art scene, art uh, artists, practicing artists, to contribute a page in a little book. It could be a drawing, it could be, again, it's about experience and memory. So, back to your question, the social media archive has been, uh, yes, used. There were some publications about pictures from Gezi. I'm in one of those books. I'm holding up a banner which says love, you know. I mean, I, I got the copy, but I think I looked at it only once. Other people will enjoy it maybe, but I just, you know, wasn't interested. If I see any, uh, also now, if I see any exhibition, about Umbrella Archive or Tahrir, I would not go. But if I never lived a demonstration like that, maybe I would be curious to go. Uh, so uh, 
if it's an outsider to your question that uses the social media archives <laughs> with has access to it it's very problematic uh, if it's somebody who was there and and the, representing his or her own posts it depends how they do it uh, but I, from ground zero from the beginning i think that's also problematic because it's social media posts sorry i think i didn't pose my question very ah, clearly sorry. so i was thinking one step further when they actually became very intuitively already an archive online digitally they can go to your social media account and already see everything happened there so it's naturally already an archive but like for historian or writers researchers who want to write about that history say in five or ten years they go to those resources and that's what they see because they have been been very systematically written or mm. archived or documented mm. those very simple material media or even like on newspaper that takes different size sites and so what do you think when the historians when the writers from outside or from different times they didn't experience that they use this simple material without systematically systematically archiving for their research for their writing and would there be any problem or would that be different outcomes? it's up to their conscious and their understanding of ethics uh, it is after all somebody's somebody others some other person's images uh, of course, there is this term desktop writing, desktop travel writing. Uh, the famous book Golden Bough, uh, which is an anthropological masterpiece, has been written by James Fraser, uh, who has never traveled outside to those places. And he, did he succeed? Yes, he succeeded. I mean, he wrote about things from other people's books. So, so he, he looked at other people's books and he wrote about uh, distant parts of the world. Uh, Mozart wrote operas about Turks. He never probably uh, been there or Othello was written by Shakespeare. Uh, has he succeeded? Uh, he has never been to Cyprus or uh, never been close to that culture? Yes. So, yes, the answer is yes, they can do it. But uh, as a person who owns those, uh, that material, I would let it go uh, after a while. I would not go back and delete it just because there's a danger of that. But if I find out that somebody has used this, uh, I would try to meet the person and say, like, why have you done it? And how, uh, as, as I said, how is very important, how they do it. We don't know. So it's a very general question. It really depends their motive, if they're exoticizing it, uh, if it's misery porn, if it's, you know, they're trying to uh, feel more comfortable because they're in a better situation and they're using... Uh, images from a demonstration of a suppressed society. So it's it's very uh, complex. But yes, the reality is that the this, uh, material is there and anybody can use it if they want. Uh, thanks so much for your talk. It's really fascinating and illuminating. Uh, I have a question relating to uh, the incompleteness of all the archives. Basically, you talk about the false deletion of some archives, possibly due to political regime, and also impossibility of archiving certain issues. Uh, in the meantime, you talked a range of archives. Some of them, um, I would say, are uh, mainly constituted of rep uh, representational materials like newspapers, photographs. Others may be, I would say, uh, interviews, oral interviews, and some of them will be based on people's, you know, uh, embodied, uh, you know, uh, spontaneous experience. But all of them, I think, uh, something may be still missing. For example, as you mentioned, for, you know, Gacy, you know, for a certain part, you wouldn't be able to, you know, archive. So I'm just wondering, in addition to the deletion or the impossibility of archives, there's also a certain part about this permanent, I would say, uh, you know, uh, incompleteness of all the archives. Of course, of course. Due no, to various Exactly. Issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the notion of archive, we understand after hosting so many talks, uh, we are not experts of archive studies or uh, we're just listening to all these talks and we find out that, as you said, it's uh, no archive is uh, giving a complete uh, vision of the world. 
of their small world. So uh, this professor who also brought up the subject, like who holds the key to the archive, first of all, who collects like that ecological archive from St. Petersburg? They choose to collect from that part of the country, but not from the eastern part. So the Kurdish audience in our uh, uh, talk was like uh, quite frustrated. They said, that, why, didn't you, why didn't your institution come to in the 80s to that part of the, uh, the country? And the answer was like, oh, we didn't have uh, access. But that, that means suddenly that archive doesn't have seeds from that part of the world. Uh, and then your intention is important, like how do you collect, how do you uh, sort them out? So uh, it's not a romantic notion, it's a very problematic notion. And uh, access, limit, um, I think no archive is objective. They have a reason to be an archive and uh, this is why states are very interested in archives, obtaining archives, deleting archives because archive is control, is governorship. Uh, in, um, in ancient Greek, uh, also the word uh, relates to governing. Exactly, because, you know, that's also exactly uh, related to my following question, very quick question, because uh, I feel you are also making archives at the moment by documenting all these events and talks. So in that sense, are you also, you know, somehow selecting like speakers or uh, topics relating to archives? In what ways uh, you tend to make uh, relatively comprehensive archives or you just, uh, you know, articulate as you mentioned, your own intention? Uh, yes. I mean, uh, after all, we are the people who choose who will come, uh, but also we are based it, uh, on the current issues in Turkey, in Istanbul. <clears throat> but if there was somebody else, he would have chosen or she would have chosen another person. So uh, this is again about the, uh, uh, the problem of objectivity. But we don't claim to be objective. We don't claim to represent all the archives on these topics. Uh, the possibilities and the impossibilities are shaping it. So as long as I think you don't have that claim, I think it's fine because the nature of doing anything, doing art, doing film, doing Asia Art Archive, what you select into the archive, what you show in this archive, how many exhibitions you do, it's completely up to the people. If this crew goes and another crew comes tomorrow, they will do a completely different Asia Art Archive. So uh, the people who are doing archive or doing things about archive, as long as they're aware of their non-objectivity, I think if they don't claim it, I think that's fair. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'd like to ask you to elaborate more on um, on um, your you and your artist friends and your kind of collective decision to not create any artwork. Um, you know, during the Gezi um, uprising. Um, and, and I'm partly asking that because I'm also thinking about, um, you know, artists that I personally work with in Hong Kong um, who have created artworks, you know, for or during or, you know, in the aftermath of, of, of the Umbrella Movement. And, and, and some, you know, some of these works, I, I would say there are there are great artworks that have made a great impression, um, you know, on me. Um, um, I, I myself have participated in the Umbrella Movement. Um, um, so, so did my artist friends. Um, and, and some of these images are still being circulated. They're still being, you know, they, they're still alive, you know, in the kind of art system or ecology that, that we are in. Um, and, 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 and that's why I wanted to kind of understand, you know, how this consensus came to be, you know, in, 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 in your circle, right? Um, um, was it an ethical problem? Was it a kind of, uh, kind of Wittgenstein kind of, you know, like everything is in, inexpressible and therefore, you know, one should not say anything? Like what, 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 what like what motivated you or like what was the, dis the discussion? I guess common sense. I mean, common sense is a better answer than just ethics. <clears throat> yeah, I thought we. I thought I think that we thought at the time, not systematically, but common in a common sense way, that what we see around us is so beautiful and so powerful. Representing it through art uh, and showing to other people would make no sense. The energy of the event was much more interesting. 
first that, like the, um, the first hand experience. And then comes the part of the artist and the ego and the signature and the copyright on top of it. So if you do something, you are James doing that and it's James artwork, but James didn't create that energy. James was there. Maybe he was part of it. Uh, couldn't have you could, couldn't couldn't have you guys done it as a collective or you know as it's the same it's the same representation i think uh, the moment was so beautiful uh why is it not enough to stop at that point why do we have to represent it uh do you think it's because to show other people what happened uh, don't you think the media has shown enough the social media feeds like if you go now you can have an understanding of what happened in umbrella movement or gezi by googling some images they are there and they're some of them are fantastic to use for some of them are difficult to understand but they are there i mean a lot of people have used their cameras i i never took my camera out it, it would be uh, it would make no sense for me to do that and uh, there is the pornography of images also like if you use this uh, several images if you compose something out of it you're actually uh, cunningly using something uh, that was put out by all these people who didn't want to be archived also. So I think there are a lot of reasons why people just came up to this uh, conclusion together without saying like, should we or should we not represent it? They said, no brainer, it's obvious. We don't wanna, <laughs> we don't wanna do this. And I do find uh, it problematic if uh, uh, some artists, but not all, uh, are uh, using uh, these demonstrations into making an artwork uh, themselves. But again, it really depends. We have to see it case by case. Like, what did they do? How did they do? Where did they show it? Which institution did they show it? Did they get money from this? Did he earn money from that? So lots of problematics. But if you want to do it, you do it. But we have the right to criticize. I mean, I, I have the right to uh, disengage from that. And I still do. Quick yeah, sure. Just a quick, up, uh, quick follow up question. Do you think it would be helpful to, to make a distinction between storytelling versus creating visuals? Because what the example with Zeno, Zeno Pekunu's performance, <coughs> the, the documentation of the performance, is that she's not showing any visuals at all, right? And then she's saying that I'm mostly into to the storytelling part of things. Um, would that be a distinction that? you discuss with the within that community that you've been talking about and maybe that could be a related to next question too. Uh, yes i mean storytelling is also another form of editing you know so you are <coughs> you are creating history again so uh, if this work that we showed from zeno pekunu was available on youtube was represented as an artwork in a museum i would find it problematic but that's a performance we see her she's there she's talking uh, about her emotions at this point i would be more comfortable if that work is performed uh, as an intimate experience of me telling you she telling us what happened but uh, storytelling is another art form so what is it different from making a film it's no different you know uh, the only difference is that the, the persona of the person telling the story is there, but in cases like Zeno Pekunus, in cases like uh, a novel writer, the storyteller is not visible when we're flipping through the pages. So it's another form of representation, and it again depends on the case, how it is done. So in this case, I welcome this kind of uh, intimate uh, relationship between the storyteller and the audience. Uh, if they are open to questions, uh, but uh, we have uh, other forms of lecture performance which develops an artist persona as well in a different way. <coughs> that could be problematic, but we have to see. Yeah, thank you for for your talk. I I find the idea of an archiving very interesting because um especially after your elaboration on say okay if the artist do this as a lecture performance or things like this you feel more comfortable right? and 
And I find this idea very interesting if you think about actually like the, the conventional notion of archive as compared to say a performative archive. Because actually if, how do you say it? Okay, for example, if we talk about um, reflection or um, how the government is deleting the archive, for example, and um, for example, Diana Taylor talk about rapture in her book, talking about how, for example, the colonial, the, the colony is trying to kind of like wash away some cultures of or local cultures of the people, and then people reenact all these things through the embodied actions. So actually, that's a way of preserving the knowledge of the cultures, even though the government actually like delete all the records, the things can still be um, transferred to the next generations of generations. So um, in this case, actually, I've been thinking that actually, like if we talk about an archive, actually would performance or performative archive be a proposal for an alternative to all this kind of like, I say, resistance to be archived? Mm, who performs, how they perform, <coughs> what they choose to perform, which part of what they're representing is performed. It's another montage. It's another editing. It's like storytelling. It's a performance. Yeah, it's corporeal. It's <clears throat> it's for some people it's more closer to the original i don't necessarily agree uh, that uh, performance of the body is the best medium for representing something that was done by another body uh, yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't know myself i mean i'm just now thinking as an artist <laughs> Uh, who is coming from a performance past. I studied theatre and I did theatre many years. Uh, but I can tell you one thing. After 2013, there has been a rise of performance groups in Turkey. Theatre groups, of theatre groups. Uh, maybe this is because they can react very quickly. Because they just need their bodies and a stage or whatever platform whereas in the other ones it's the montage is longer maybe this is the reason or it's part of the corporeality of the protest movements of people's need to uh, show it with their body it could be but I see I still uh, see this uh, increase in numbers of uh, people uh, going to these performances people doing these uh, performances whether they do things they uh, as I represent, I, I like to be represented or not is a different matter. I think maybe I, I add one more example. Yes, yeah. I'm not sure if you went to the um, candlelight. I was there. As I'm the last light, and actually it was a very interesting kind of like ritual performance. Every year people are doing this try to remember events that happened 30 years ago in Beijing. And um, actually, after the Umbel movement, I personally have a new understanding of this candlelight event every year. Because I, I think it, it is not only to ask us to remember what happened in 1989 in Beijing but also how, how we should keep this in our mind that actually the government, how the government is, is um, repressing the people or even killing the people in the massacre. So um, this when, when the story has been retold and retold and retold and retold, and then the action has been react, react, and we, we stage and we stage every year. So actually the younger people actually who, who learn the story from the so-called older generation, and then maybe they have a different understanding of the event 
after all. So actually, I, I see the positive side of this kind of like representation. Could be, but some people could say, uh, for example, uh, yesterday on the big screen, I saw footage, video footage of people being killed. So the image on the Tiananmen Square uh, being held, being carried with uh, whatever they found. Uh, some people could argue that to show those images constantly is maybe reminding us of what the authorities have done and to keep that memory alive. For example, uh, there are people in Germany who refuse any representation of Adolf Hitler. They don't even want to say his name. But uh, when I lived in Germany, I remember this is the reason why I stopped watching TV because <clears throat> they had five or six channels. But every night there was one image when I was zapping of Adolf Hitler, always. It was whether a program who was like criticizing Adolf Hitler. Of course, they all criticize you. You can't like <laughs> praise Adolf Hitler in Germany, but his image is always there. So the, the, the memory was kept alive. So this could be also problematic, for example, in the vigil I saw. It was interesting for me to see people talking as much as I had been translated by my friend. But when the images of uh, the people being killed in the, the field, for example, I was not so comfortable. And I know that in Turkey, after certain bombings uh, in Kurdish demonstrations, people have been discussing that in the commemoration, they never show any kind of uh, those kind of scenes. So for some, it could be very positive, but for some, it could be uh, even destructive or negative. So I think this is something that it, the the people negotiate between themselves and the beauty of this negotiation is that you should not you don't have to argue with the other person but you have to argue <laughs> maybe for a greater uh, cause so i think uh, yeah i mean it's a positive thing probably i'm not uh, entitled to say too much about what i've seen but i've been moved myself i can say that uh, but I also thought that it was a bit too much ritualized in the way, very programmed. Uh, and I <coughs> have a feeling that young people might oppose to that in Hong Kong, but I'm not sure. I just have an intuition. Oh, it's just a simple question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I think a lot of artists in Hong Kong share a sentiment about unarchiving or refuse to make work during or after the umbrella movement. So it's fine. Um, I appreciate that. So I'd like to know what was your practice before the uprising and what is your practice now other than hosting talks and your involvement in activism? Does the uprising change your practice now or do you refuse to? A, visual artist altogether. I was a filmmaker, video artist before, and I'm a video maker, a video artist, filmmaker uh, now. Uh, it's hard to answer that question. It probably changed some things, uh, the way I look at things, the way I record things. Uh, but my primary uh, like line has not changed. I still make films, I still work with images, but I did not produce anything for uh, one year after the Gezi because I was too busy doing things for related to Gezi. I canceled shows, a lot of friends of mine were also telling the institutions like we can't do anything now, we don't have that set of mind. Uh, there are probably some invisible and unspeakable things that I can not explain to you that have changed in my personal being uh, there is definitely there is something but it didn't change my occupation as a like can you a give filmmaker. me an example of the work that you're doing now or something that you did a, or as a comparison? I make documentaries uh, about rituals so I'm interested in uh, rituals uh, communities do the last piece I showed in Manila, which is now in display, is about a beauty pageant in uh, Tel Aviv of o overseas Filipino workers. The way they use beauty pageants. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's an example. There is one more question. We have to wrap up as well, so maybe we can ask a question. And if it's a quick one, that would be super amazing because we'll continue the conversation afterwards. No, this could be a long one. I'm not tired. Yeah. <laughs> My question is. Like, Thank you, Kuka. My question is actually very simple. So uh, this is, after the archive is actually a talk series, right? Yeah. 
And then uh, do you, do the audience uh, gradually develop to do something together among themselves? Do they start to do something together? Uh, this is the first uh, practical question I ask. The second uh. thing is about language. I wonder what are uh, the talk series, uh, the talks mainly conducted in, because if the talk series are in uh, English in Hong Kong, um, it would only, uh, some only part of the population will be coming. So I'm interested in how, when organizing a talk series like that, uh, in in the context of ter uh, Istanbul, uh, what would be the problem of language? Be uh, of course Turkish mainly, and uh, our next speaker uh, is going to be Bonaventure Nedi Kunk from Berlin, and he speaks. Uh, he doesn't speak Turkish, so he speaks uh, English. At this moment, we don't have the funds. We researched a lot to make simultaneous, uh, but we couldn't find. Uh, it's highly over our like non-budget. Uh, but what we do is that our recordings are very important. So in the future, we will subtitle everything in English. So to reach an audience which is outside of Turkey. But in Turkey, we are doing primarily uh, talks uh, in Turkish or trying to have it translated somehow. What we did in the Seed Archive was very interesting. We asked everyone, like those people who do not speak fluent English, can you please come to the back? And we were 10 people, our friends. We sat next to somebody and we did the whisper translation. And this was quite helpful. Uh, in the future, we hope to have like all these, you know, headphones. And then uh, your first question, did people do some things? <coughs> Small groups have met after the ecological archive talk. And uh, I think uh, there was one seed archivist, uh, seed collector from uh, the Arbakir, the Kurdish region, who said it was very useful for him to meet other archive seed uh, organics, uh, seed uh, practicing uh, seed archivists from the west of the country. So this was very, very happy. We made, uh, was made us very, very happy. Uh, we did something that we don't show here. We went to the Arbakir, the Kurdish uh, region, and we had an undocumented uh, talk, a workshop with no audience. We gathered together uh, all the arch uh, people working on archives, forced disappearance, um, architectural archives, city archives, um, archives about people who have been tortured. So we went and we were in a room like this. We invited everyone for two days. We had a session. We just talked and talked. And so this was like a like a useful workshop for people. And uh, some of the people there probably have continued to talk with each other. Uh, but uh, of course, we wouldn't really know this. And we don't want to control what happened after that i think we should open i, I think uh, this is only my opinion in my group that we should let it uh, go but we don't make a special effort to tell people that do something after this between yourselves it would be against our kind of spirit thank you so much thank you.